If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Yeah, we can definitely do that, or we could be better clinicians and use our ultrasound. Today, I wanted to talk to you about arguably the most important ultrasound artifact that exists. Now, it's crazy. When we first started using point-of-care ultrasound, the textbooks actually thought that ultrasound of the lungs wasn't something that we could do because of the artifacts, right? But we subsequently learned all this stuff, like pneumonia, PEs, pneumothoraces, everything. And the, the most important artifact, I think, is something called a beeline or a blind. Now let's talk about exactly what beelines are. So let's define them. So beelines are vertical artifacts that start at the pleural line and move with pleural line movement, so move, move with respiration, and they extend down to the bottom part of the visible screen. Now one thing that I get asked occasionally is to see beelines, do I need to have the depth down to the 21 centimeters or the 18 centimeters? And yeah, you, you definitely can, but really you only need to have it down to about eight or so centimeters. The reason why you need to have it down a little bit further than just the pleural line, like as you would for like a pneumothorax, is because occasionally you can get these little uh, like irregularities in the pleural line. And these irregularities in the pleural line can sometimes cause little tiny, some people call them Z-lines, little tiny artifacts that aren't true B-lines that don't represent any kind of known pathology. So I like to have it extended a little bit further than just that, that pleural line. My guide is usually I do around eight centimeters. Let's talk about exactly how beelines are formed. There are a couple of different theories. Kind of the, the first one that got brought up is the thickened interlobular septa theory. And that is that you have a little bit of fluid in the interlobular septa um, at the uh, end of the lung, the kind of terminal um, portion of the breathing apparatus of the lung where the gas exchange actually occurs. So around there you have thickened septa in between the units. And this causes a reverberation artifact. So the, the little sound signals will kind of come down bounce around in the interlobular septa and create this kind of repetitive reverberation artifact that we know of as beelines. There is an alternative theory that is called, well, it doesn't really have a name, but I call it either the tetrahedron model or the bubble theory where you have, so you have like a little alveolus, right? You have like a little alveolus that is full of fluid right next to an alveolus that has mostly air. So the interface between air and fluid creates a very reflective surface for sound. So if you have the sound wave that goes through a fluid-filled alveolus and hits that air-filled alveolus, it'll actually bounce around in there, right? So let's say that you have that fluid-filled alveolus surrounded by air-filled alveoli, you have a continuous sound wave that's coming down from the transducer. It's going to bounce around in there, right? Now, exactly how it's formed doesn't really matter. What matters is, is that you understand that although we think about it mostly in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, it actually happens any time that you have increase in density in the lung tissue. There's actually a nice graph right here where you can see how it goes from an air-filled lung where it's just A lines to a couple of B lines to a bunch of B lines to straight up just consolidation, right? So it just means increase in density. And that's important because this increase in density means that B lines, although we think about it in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, is not only present in cardiogenic pulmonary edema. There are so many other things that can have B lines. We got ARDS, we have atelectasis, we have um, preeclampsia, we can have HAPE, we can have um, interstitial lung disease. There are so many things that can cause B lines that are not cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Speaking of which, how do we know when these B lines are actually pathologic? So there are some criteria, right? If you have one or two beelines, it doesn't necessarily mean that the patient has pathology. I mean, if you ever scan patients at an ultrasound conference, especially uh, down by the bases, you'll very often see one or two beelines present. That doesn't necessarily mean pathology. It means that the models that are just sitting there aren't really breathing all that deeply and they might have a little bit of atelectasis. Now, I have no evidence to back what I'm about to say, but I really feel like the most common overall cause of beelines is actually atelectasis because it's got to be the most Common, right? So what we really need is three or more beelines in a zone for you to be able to call it pathologic. Now what exactly is a zone? So there's these crazy 28 zone protocols, right? But what I like is something that was published in the 2012 International Consensus document. Now there they just had four zones per each hemithorax, really easy. Now the exact place that you divide them is I think kind of variable. So definitely start sternum, 
anterior axillary line as the divisions here, but as far as where you put the vertical divisions, or the, excuse me, the horizontal divisions, that's variable because some people have really tiny lungs, some you know people have like obstructive airways disease and they'll have a super long, deep lung. So you just have to try and divide the um, anterior and lateral chest into four equal zones on each side. To have a positive zone, you have to have those three or more B lines per zone. So that makes you a positive or pathologic zone. Now it's not just within one inner space, it's in that zone. So if you have like a B line here, a B line here, and a B line here, technically that would make that anterior zone a positive zone. If you have two or more positive zones per side, so two on this side, two on this side, you have diffuse interstitial edema. That's considered diffuse interstitial edema, and you gotta think about the pathology that might have that diffuse interstitial edema. Often, it is cardiogenic pulmonary edema, but not necessarily. It could definitely be other pathologic processes like ARDS, like HAPE, like preeclampsia. Now, let's go back to actually counting those B lines. So sometimes it's really easy. You can easily see like one discrete B line, two discrete B lines, three distinct B lines, but occasionally it becomes a little more difficult. So what happens is sometimes your patient is in pretty bad respiratory distress. It's moving back and forth. There might be a lot of commotion, might be kind of difficult. There are a couple of different ways that you can actually count these. So one thing, if you don't have any kind of advanced software on your machines is you hit the freeze button and then with your mouse you just kind of like cycle back until you get to the frame that has the highest amount of beelines and individually count those. There are some protocols where they actually look at what percentage of an inner space has it and they assume that if the entire thing is wide it's 10 and they divide it basically into kind of 10 different sections and uh, do a percentage that way assuming that 10 is the max that you can get in a rib space but there are some systems that actually have auto beeline calculators where they actually have AI that can count it for you. So the idea that there exists AI in some software and some products to auto count your beelines is part of the reason why I'm podcasting outside. I very rarely do this. I want to show you guys the view that I have right now. Sorry, it's a little windy. So I'm in Sydney, Australia for the very last Mac. And one of the companies that has auto beeline calculators built in, they have this great AI, is the GE Venue. GE actually helped sponsor my trip to Sydney. There is a recent publication that compared the AI on the GE Venue to an expert over looking at it and they had great correlation. Definitely an option that you can look into if you need a little bit of help actually counting your beelines. So beelines, not just for cardiogenic pulmonary edema, anytime that you have an increase in density in those lungs, it can definitely give you those beelines. So remember, beelines are a data point. They're not the only thing that is important to understand. Beelines doesn't always mean cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Contusion, ARDS, occasionally pneumonia, and we can talk about pneumonia later because I, I don't usually use beelines by themselves to diagnose pneumonia usually, but one thing that can be helpful for sure. Um, ARDS, there's HAVE, there's so much. Don't forget about those beelines. Don't forget that they can be very useful for you, apart even from the differentiation between COPD, CHF, which is how we usually think about it. Hopefully that was helpful for you guys and it wasn't too complicated of a review of beelines. Now I am on my way back home from Smack. There was just this whirlwind event. It was so much fun. I got to speak with my bestie on stage, Ben Smith, and I got to do a few workshops um, that were just fulfilling and it reminds me how much I love doing this stuff. Now if you want to come and do some more workshops with me, with Ben, with Mike Mallon, with Mike Stone, with a bunch of other phenomenal ultrasound instructors, head over to castlefest2019.com which is actually happening pretty soon. And that reminds me, GE who again sponsored this podcast has another partnership with us where they are giving away free scholarships to come to Castlefest or to Benfest. Check out the dates right here. Now the way that you can apply to get this scholarship is send us a tweet, send us an email about a good ultrasound case or just why you want to go and we would love to see you there. This is for the admission price to either conference free of charge courtesy of GE.